The Australian Journal of Earth Sciences is, is the Geological Society of Australia's premier geoscience journal. We publish some um, Alturinga and some other, other things, but this is our main general geology journal. And it's published by um, Taylor and Francis. So the talk I'm going to give today is a shortened version of a, a talk I've given a few times at ANU and down in Tasmania. Um, and even though I draw on my experience with Talon and Francis, it's more general than Talon and Francis. AJS has been around for 67 years, had a, di had a different name for about half of that time, but um, for over 35 years, it's been the Australian Journal of Earth Sciences. So Kate's just been talking about communication and communication is really important. Uh, doesn't, you've got to think about who you write, who you're communicating with, is it private, is it public, is it evaluated or non-evaluated? And so a lot of what you have been doing in this last week are talking in seminars or conferences proceedings, and they're different to peer-reviewed peer articles. And I'm going to be talking about, am I get the laser pointer up? I'm going to be talking about written peer-reviewed articles. In some ways, these are the easiest form of communication you'll have for three main reasons. One, you've got time. You've got plenty of time to work on it and revise it and go round and round with it. Another, you have the benefit of peer review. You may hate your peer reviewers, but they usually help your process to make your article clearer in what you want to say and get rid of any mistakes. And these, peer-reviewed articles can commonly have, because they are longer, you can commonly include data as well as illustrations that other, other things may not do. I understand these talks are being recorded, so there's a lot of these links you may want to look at later. So the publishing cycle is big. Publishers can be big companies. Uh, and you as an author and me as an editor, we're just a very small part of it. And this shows where we all fit in this thing. So as an author, you submit your paper to the journal, which the editor picks up. Generally, this is by an electronic submission site. Not these days, not always, but generally that's the case. And the editor will do a, a quick review to decide, is this suitable for our journal? If they say yes, they send it out for peer review. You wait a while, probably longer than you should have to. And you get referees comments back and they get sent back to you and you're told it's terrific. It's only ever happened once that a paper's got both reviewers saying it should be published as is, uh, or it needs minor, major modifications or rejected. And so you may go around this, stay in this loop for some time going backwards and forwards unless you get rejection. And eventually it goes out to the journal editorial office in our case, the editor does a first pass copy editing, fixes your references, even though they shouldn't have to, um, and fixes the English language, etc. And then the journal will send it to the publisher and it comes out and is printed, and that's distributed to libraries and readers see it. And data, open, open data repositories are now becoming a very important thing where you can put all your data online so that other people have easy access to it. So what are publishers for? Well, there's a book written called The Content Machine by Michael Bushka in 2013 that summarised this and that's they filter the research. They get, hopefully, they get rid of the nonsense. They get rid of the stuff that's wrong or badly framed. They, they make it look good. They take it from your typewritten manuscript pages and turn it into something that looks nice with figures in it and, all the hyperlinks active and all the rest of it. And they put it in a nice cover if it's going to be published in hard copy or they put it online in a good looking website. The publisher also helps amplify this by disseminating it. They have market strategies. They do a whole lot of online promotion and they make it discoverable and visible. So there's no point you publishing your paper and you're having it in your bottom drawer no one can find it or read it. So discoverability and visibility is very important. And I'll be talking about that later in, in the talk. 
So which journal is the best fit for your paper? This is really important because this can be a major problem, a major cause for rejection. And not all journals are suited to all papers. So you've got to think about who do I want to read my paper? And therefore, which is the most appropriate journal? So Nature is not necessarily the most appropriate journal for every paper that you will write. Um, I can say, personally, I have been rejected by Nature by more, on more than one occasion. I do have one paper in Nature, though, and I'll die with one page in Nature, I expect. Is it an international journal? Is this important? Sometimes it's not. Is it peer-reviewed? How long will the process take? Who is the editor? Who's the editorial board? Who publishes the journal? Is it affiliated with an academic society like the Geological Society? Does the journal have a quality metric or ranking system? Is it open access? And how much will it cost to have your paper published? And all these things, these questions can only be answered by the authors because it's about who they want, how they want to get their paper out there and who they want to read it. So, but on the downside, choosing the right journal can be, can be a problem. I, you have all probably received emails from journals asking you to submit papers. They guarantee um, reviewing within 48 hours and all the rest of it. These are called predatory journals and suspicious publishers. And there's, there's hundreds of them, if not thousands of them around the world. They're there to make money. They commonly do not publish your work. It just disappears after they get the check after they bank your, you make your electronic fund transfer, the, pa the paper just disappears and it may take you months and months to realise you've been done. So you need to check a journal. Well, if someone who sends you an email and you don't recognise the journal name, I would check, check on them. Um, and there's this website here uh, where you can enter the names of journals. Uh, a professor... An a, an a Canberra based professor, uh, who I won't name, a very, a very senior geologist, was so excited he got on to me that um, this company in, in Wall Street wanted to take up his paper and do something with it. And I, well, fortunately, it was an email, so I had time to get on. So I Googled the name of this, the, this, this publisher. And I had to get, and he was in his 90s, so he was a bit disappointed when I said, subtly said, Maybe you should have a look at this. I suspect this is a con. <laughs> and it was a con. So make sure you don't get caught in that trap because it's, you waste your time, your effort, and you might lose thousands of dollars. So quality measures. Quality measures are important mainly for academics. That you, um, funders and universities take Quality measures, very important. CSIRO doesn't care about them so much. The surveys don't care about them that much. And industry doesn't care at all. They, they rank things differently. And quality measures, we all know, even a a a ARC is thinking hard about them because they are, they are gamed. There's lots of corruption in these quality measures. But the most, uh, the most commonly used one is the impact factor. And, and we've de I've defined here how the impact factor is, is calculated. And that's over two years. There's the five-year impact factor. Elsevier has its own called Site Score. The Arts and Humanities in Citation Index is one that focuses on non-science. And then there's Scopus, which has less coverage than the Web of Science and it's not quite as highly regarded. So you'll see reference to many impact factors. And these, are, these may be important to you, because uh, sometimes, particularly in universities, they are used for hiring decisions, for tenure, for salary increases, and allocation of research results, resources. So they can be important. And there was this paper in Nature um, in 2010, Do Metrics Matter? So it depends on who you are and where you sit, whether these metrics matter. The, um, the metric tide is a report, a UK report that was put out in 2015 that looks at uh, different journal metrics and some of the corruption issues and what can be done about it. 
But there are other forms of impact, as Kate has talked about. You know, stu do students use your papers? Is the public interested? Downloads of papers. Um, you can write impact statements. In some areas, patents are really important. Altrometric is, is a ranking that tracks um, your impact on the internet and various things like that. And if you look at the AJS website, each paper has an altrometric score that varies over time because as you get different hits, it will go, go up. So things like um, if there is a Twitter comment about your paper, that, that will be caught up. If there's traditional media has picked it up, that will be picked up. And then there are also online reference managers like um, Mendeley and site like you. So if you've got a paper, you might be interested to have a look and see what your altrometric score is. I'm sure all, paper, all publishers have these things and they, they are worth um, keeping an eye on. So copyright is an important thing. When, when a paper has been accepted, you'll be asked to transfer your copyright or to provide a license to print. A legitimate publisher will not print your paper unless they have legal authority to do so. So in the case of AJS, you can transfer the copyright. The Geological Society of Australia owns the copyright, not the publisher. You could transfer the copyright to them or you could, many government agencies like Geoscience Australia or the Geological Surveys retain crown copyright. And so they provide a, a license to print the paper. The, um, the copyright trans transfer applies to the copy of record and not to the accepted manuscript. So this is the formatted version that you see in the journal or the online version, not to your submitted manuscript. You own the copyright to that. So these are some of the, the, um, the definitions of, of what various stages in a manuscript are. And it's only the bottom ones that are relevant for copyright. So open access is, be, is becoming a big thing. There's, three different sorts of open access. Um, and there are some online journals that are called open access. The whole journal is open access and it's free to publish your paper on that journal. Uh, it's paid for by advertising, but you need to check how long the paper, because if it folds over because of lack of funding, your paper will disappear off the, off the site. There's gold open access journals where you pay for it in your paper. It covers the cost of publishing the paper and maintaining the online access. And then there are hybrid journals, uh, hybrid open access journals, and AJS is a hybrid open access journal. So you can publish your paper uh, without paying any money um, and it will be, a, the, be behind a paywall, or you can pay some dollars. In our case, it's about 3000 US dollars and it will become open access. So it's a mixture of both and it's up to the authors to what they decide to do. Geoscience Australia has a policy of publishing all of their stuff as open access. Um, open access is a requirement of some funding agencies, particularly in medical research. But in these, these, for, in these areas, the funding bodies usually provide separate funds to pay for the gold open access. In the earth sciences, that generally doesn't occur and you've got to find the money from somewhere else. Um, I know this, this graph here shows that it's a, a decade old, but it shows that um, earth sciences have quite a lot of gold, green open access but journals, but lesser amounts of gold open access journals. So publishing, ethics in publishing is really important. This is where you can fall down in a big heap. And these are some of the issues. The main issues are on the left, dual submissions, plagiarism, anyone who's been through a university in the last decade should know all about this stuff, but it's surprising that it still happens. Fake reviewers, you, you, people, you put down a, you nominate a reviewer who doesn't exist or it's a, your best friend who knows nothing about the sub subject. There are other issues, ethical issues that have been identified, reviewing rings, I'll review your paper and give it a tick if you review mine regional bias, seniority bias, competitive delays. Oh, this person's got a paper that's just like mine and I'm gonna sit on it. So mine comes out before them. Or stealing their work. 
gender bias and false identity. There's a whole lot of issues and then none of them are any good. We, there are now lots of online things where you can check for particularly for plagiarism and there's an, an index there. So if you do plagiarise, the chances are you're going to get caught. Uh, even self-plagiarising is a, is a, can be an issue. You should not submit a paper to more than one journal at, the at a time. You always acknowledge your co-authors and fellow researchers, your, your resources and your data sources. Uh, and the author must follow national and international ethics when using human or humans or human tissue which, and animals, which doesn't apply to most of us, but I'm, I publish in the biological field occasionally. And do not submit an incomplete paper just to get some feedback. But if you want to know more about ethics, the Committee on Publication Ethics, or COPE, is, which Talon Francis or AJS is a member of, has a massive amount of people uh, information online. You can look up, look up vast past cases. A lot of these are in the medical field, as you might expect. There's not enough money in earth sciences to, to really get you in big trouble in doing the wrong thing. In earth sciences, there are some specific things that we need to use. The geological time scale, which I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, but wait, you may not be, and you can look it up at, on stratigraphy.org, but you may not realise it changes all the time. So this one I've got here is the third variation of this for 2020. So if you're going to use uh, geological time, and it's mainly the dates, the change, but things do change. I still get papers talking about the tertiary and the tertiary has not existed formally in the geological timescale for a decade. So make sure you use the, um, the proper timescale. The Australian Stratigraphic Names Database is run by GA. And so if you're look in, working in Australia and using stratigraphic names or, or rock unit names, just check the database. It's very easy. You just log onto that site, put your name in, and it will tell you if it's if it is the current name or or if it's out of date. Very useful thing. Then there's just some other things here um, on whether to use lower and upper and early and late. How to use stratigraphic terminology in a paper, and the other one on mineral. There are some standards for mineral abbreviations. Surprise, surprise. So you've submitted your paper and it can be rejected. There's a whole, these are the top 10 reasons why a paper might be rejected. Now, one, it doesn't fit the journal's aims and scope and fail, fails to engage with the issues addressed by the journal. You'd be surprised at how many papers that we receive that have nothing to do with the earth sciences. Poor regard to the conventions of the journal, poor theoretical framework, too long or too short, ignoring word limits, bad style, grammar, punctuation, or poor English, fails to say anything of any significance, poorly contextualised, conclusions can't be justified, it's not a proper journal article, it's a cut and paste of a thesis chapter or a consultancy report, or it's defamatory or unethical. I've seen them all. It's probably only the top five are the ones that um, the editor will pick up before sending it out to review. So what do you do if your paper is rejected? Well, I'd suggest do nothing for a few days, calm down, scream, at the, scream the reviewers' names at the wall if you need them. It's not worth getting into a discussion with the editor about reviewers. It won't alter the decision and you could do yourself some harm. Look at the reviewers' comments calmly, change the paper, and submit to another journal. If you do submit elsewhere, take care to alter your paper to the new style of that journal. Editors can easily detect a paper that was submitted to a rival publication. For example, if you don't change the reference style, it happens all the time. It's also, if, if you're asked to make heavy amendments and resubmit, you may have to decide whether it's worthwhile. Maybe it wasn't, that journal wasn't appropriate, you may get rejected again. You might be better off going elsewhere. I'm also surprised at how many times I send a paper off that looks sort of okay, looks like it's relevant to us, then I send it off to be reviewed. 
and I somehow picked the reviewer that did it for the other journal. That's really bad luck. So when you're starting out, so you have some suggestions from me to make, to make the journey easier. Working with your few fellow students, reviewing papers helps develop your writing skills. You'll also learn about your fellow students' research. Figures should be properly drafted to be submitted as high definition graphics files. Your co-authors must read the manuscripts and agree to, to the text and figures are ready for publication. Read the instructions. It's obvious when a paper is submitted following rejection elsewhere. Check the references style, referencing style. I'd suggest to use a referencing program. Um, I'm surprised how few authors use these things, even though they're readily available. Reviewers do not like poorly edited papers, and this will bias their response. They're only human. If you've got any questions, read the instructions again, and then contact the editor. So I've got two slides about the paper, the title and abstract. Take care when choosing your title. It's the gateway to your paper. As Kate was saying, this is the thing that's going to grab the editor and grab the reader. There's research to show that sh shorter title papers get more uh, downloads than long title papers. Be concise, accurate informative, and informative. Be discoverable by search engines. The title should describe the content of the paper but remain short. You don't use acronyms, abbreviations or jargon. Keywords are commonly required and they do help with search engines, even though search engines like Google actually search the whole paper. The abstract should be a short summary of your completed research and should include motivation, the methods, the results and conclusions. Check the instructions to authors. I know I've said this before, but still worth doing it. Commonly, paper, journals have word limits and, and whether it needs to be structured or unstructured. Try to find other abstracts that are similar to your research from to, the, to your target journals. So, writing the article itself, which you commonly do before you do the title and the abstract. So, read the journal you're intending to submit it to to see if it's the right one. Stick to the point. Don't be afraid to explain. Clarity is key. It's all about communication. If you don't understand it, no one else will. Be aware of literature in your field and reference it. Make your references current and relevant. Be original. Figures and tables should enhance the dis discussion, not repeat it. And there's two, two things that are on the bottom here. The open science fr framework, this is, this is where you can put early data up for sharing with other people and get feedback on. And if you've got a lot of data, uh, or even a small amount of data, um, that it, you should try and put these up in a data repository. We have until recently used supplementary papers, but these can be sometimes harder for people to find. These international data repositories are a, very, a great improvement, and this link here will help you find the data repository that's most suitable for you. You can get some more tips on this from the Asia, from the Taylor and Francis website, and I'm sure from other publishers' websites as well. So just to finish up, I was, there's a whole lot of reference and bibliographic tools. I tend to use EndNote. I know EndNote's available for free download for any university student. I don't know why you don't use it. It would make your life much, and my life, much better. After publications, so you've got your paper accepted um, and you want it to be found. You've got to make it discoverable. There's a whole, some tips here. Add the URL of your published paper to your email signature. Uh, if you're presenting at an upcoming conference, reference to your article. Uh, maximise your web presence. Use Link your article from your university or personal web page. Link your article from your blog or your social networks. But be careful not to uh, break the copyright, not to breach your copyright. You can put up your final accepted version and you will, will not be in breach of your copyright. And you, research, you can use social media. Uh, if, if you can, ResearchGate, which is owned by Bill Gates, by Microsoft, encourages people to breach copyright. 
which, and, which is sort of ironic considering their views about um, downloading illegal versions of their programs. So there's a few things here about being a reviewer because I sometimes get students to draw review papers for me. But being a reviewer is, is very important. It can take a lot of time and effort, but there are some rewards for the reviewers. It's part of their academic role. It gives them access to research results ahead of publication. They might learn something new. The process involves, improves your writing style unless you're perfect already. Uh, it helps you develop relationships with other researchers. And you'll usually be acknowledged in the paper or journal. And now there's a site, Publons, where you actually get credit for all the reviews you do. How does an editor select reviewers? Well, in our case, we ask authors to recommend reviewers. Um, they can be recommended by others or they're published on a similar topic. You may not be in a position to review all aspects of the paper, but, um, but you should make this clear to the editor. The editor's expectations are pretty minor. Um, I, will, you, well, I expect them to identify significance of the research, assess the validity of the approach and interpretation, assess the logic of the paper's structure, and are all publications considered. Some editors, some reviewers, actually do a lot of copy editing, and I love them for that, but it's not an expectation. So here's some more useful tools for authors to read. Uh, we, we ask all, um, all authors to give us, if they have one, to give us an ORCID, which is like a tax file number for authors, because it, it, there are some names that are very common. And since this is a, it's a unique identifier, and it will have, if you're using it, all the papers you publish will be able to be found on the ORCID website. In preparing for this talk, I came across this website down the bottom. It's based, it comes out of ANU called the thesiswhisperer.com, which I've only just started to explore, but it's got tips about publishing, but it's got a whole lot of tips about mental health and finishing writing your PhD, the whole range of issues that may be of interest to you. Any questions?